that we don't know if we do know the cancer NGO from Canada. The title is Global Scientific Task Force Tackles Linkage Between Mixtures of Humanity and Counter Chemicals and the Development of Cancer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Watanabe, thank you so much for inviting us, and uh, our co-chairs, uh, Dr. Sone and uh, Dr. Winchi, uh, thanks so much, um, distinguished guests. I have the uh, pleasure today of introducing, I guess, the uh, project that we did a few years ago uh, called the Halifax Project. It was called the Halifax Project because it, was, it started in Halifax, which is a city in Nova Scotia in Canada. And I'm, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the background to the project, uh, the, the environmental carcinogenesis issue, uh, cancer biology, some of the risks associated with low-dose exposures and mixtures of commonly encountered chemicals, and I'll speak uh, about the hallmarks of cancer and mode of action, and some future research directions and potential implications. Um, my colleague, Bill Goodson, who's here today, uh, will talk in detail about the project uh, results, but um, I'm going to try and work at a higher level, and uh, some of my slides are intentionally uh, been simplified because I want everybody in the room to be on the same page uh, when we discuss later on in the workshop about some certain concepts that we worked on. So I've, I've really tried to create uh, something that we can have as a common starting point for today's uh, and tomorrow's discussions. Um, first, I want to speak briefly about why we feel so passionate about studying chemicals in the environment, in particular mixtures, is that um, in 1981, a landmark paper by Dahl and Pito uh, laid out the percentage of cancers caused by factors that could be modified and factors in the environment and roughly they grouped lifestyle factors things like smoking and diet and uh, behavior uh, alcohol sun exposure as being roughly 90 percent of the problem and they uh, showed a diminished value of other exposures uh, down in two and three percent and for the next 20 or 30 years, we chased lifestyle factors as causative, uh, ca causative factors in cancer, and in particular in North America and Europe, and I don't know if you had a similar experience in Japan, but funding for environmental health uh, was diminished, especially around cancer, because it was believed that there were much more important factors that mattered uh, to a much greater extent. Um, in 2010, the most advanced and most recent epidemiological study changed that number considerably. And the best, it was an entire special issue published in the British Journal of Cancer. Um, and they could only show 43% of cancers were attributed to both lifestyle and environmental factors. And 57% was unexplained. And Richard Pito, who was a co-author of the article, the, the paper back in 1981, uh, I had private correspondence with him, and he said that the other 57% was probably undiscovered and yet avoidable causes. Now, we're not arguing that um, this is entirely due to chemicals in the environment, but that's a lo very large percentage of cancers that remain unexplained. And that was uh, using a much updated uh, version of what we have from an epidemiological standpoint, much better information. Um, I want to overlay on that what has, you know, this epidemiological work was done with a relatively crude understanding of how cancer and carcinogenesis occurs. Um, and I want to overlay on that the very rapid uh, changes in evolution in our understanding of cancer biology. Many of you will have seen this uh, poster which appears on many people's lab walls. This is published by Garland Science, but it shows many of the pathways and intracellular pathways and mechanisms related to many aspects of the cell during carcinogenesis. And in 2000 and then in 2011, Hanahan and Weinberg published the hallmarks of cancer, which were roughly 10 categories of attributes that they believe are genetic phenotypes that are achieved by immortalized cells that are attributable to most cancers. 
Um, what the question we were asking uh, from an environmental standpoint is how does this advanced understanding of our biology inform how we look at environmental causation and the co potential contribution of chemicals in the environment to cancer. I'm just going to speak briefly through the hallmarks so that everybody in the room is on the same page and everybody understands what the hallmarks of cancer are about. I know that some of you study cancer, so please bear with me. Those of you who don't, I hope that you'll have come away with a better understanding that will inform our discussions for the next uh, day and a half. So the first one is genetic instability, that all cancer cells are genetically unstable, and an immortalized self-replicating cell that's making copies of itself is both suffering damage during the replication process and produ producing mutant clones of itself that aren't all the same, which produces mutant subpopulations and results in various subpopulations of cells that are immortalized in different ways. That's really important. A DNA repair, which would normally fix the kinds of damage that is occurring, is overwhelmed. It's either not functioning or it's not functioning at enough capacity to be able to repair the kind of damage that's happening in these immortalized cells. There is a source of sustained proliferative signaling. And remember, these are phenotypes, which means they can be achieved in different ways. So this sustained proliferative signaling might be enabled by different, geno ge different underlying genotypes. And so this may be ligand stimulation from an external, uh, external agent. It may be due to a disruption of intracellular communication. The fact is, is there are multiple underlying genotypes that achieve sustained proliferative signaling in these cells. And then some evasion of the normal tumor suppressor capacity that would stop cells from replicating when they shouldn't be. So uh, things like p53 or PRB, um, proteins that uh, we've studied for years that have the capacity to interrupt the sequence and stop things if necessary, which is where they got the name tumor suppressors, those things aren't working properly in cancer cells either. And then Different, various forms of cell death, like resistance, uh, uh, sorry, like apoptosis, are being um, suppressed. So apoptosis, for example, either isn't working or sometimes it's being bypassed. And other forms of cell death aren't working properly either. So that's why these various immortalized clones are interesting, the, the differences between them, because some of them might be disabled in uh, this Resistance to cell death may be achieved in one way in some cancer cells, and yet in the same cancer there may be other subpopulations that are, have resistance to cell death that's being enabled by a different genotype, but both are accomplishing the ability to bypass what would normally be the capacity of the cell to shut itself down. The, there is a replicative immortality that is occurring in these cells, they should have a limited number of copies that they can make of themselves. A cell that has repeatedly made copies of itself should have a limit. And the telomeres on the cells are supposed to be measuring, but in cells that are cancerous, the, for the specific phenotype has the ability to bypass that capacity. And so we're not seeing cells stopping replicating, which they should be. They also have dysregulated metabolism. Many of them have shifted into glycolysis. They're in a hypoxic environment. The tumorous mass has, has created a cluster of cells with inadequate vascularization. And for that reason, the cells in the middle aren't getting enough oxygen. And because they're not getting enough oxygen, the cells have to shift to glycolysis to function and to survive. And that hypoxic environment contributes to the instability that the cells are experiencing. And that shift in glycolysis is an important signifying event. It, it indicates that the cells are in a tumorous mass, but it also characterizes them in ways that makes them different from other cells. Additionally, they're evading the immune system, and there have been very detailed papers written on all the various immune system elements that should be able to stop uh, tumors from forming, and the various functions on the surface of the cell, like receptors, like MHC class 2, for example, that are supposed to be able to signal that they're in trouble, 
that that's not functioning properly and for different reasons, different aspects of the immune system are not functioning properly, whether those are T cells or dendritic cells or uh, macrophage, various components are not functioning properly. And so that's another dysfunction that we see that is typical in all cancers. But remember, you'll recall those tumorous mass that's not uh, getting enough oxygen. It's calling for more vascularization and it generates a VEGF, which is a factor that attracts new vascularization to try and feed the tumor with enough blood to uh, create more, a better oxygen supply. And that becomes a bit of a tangled mess around the tumor that uh, is also surrounded by inflammation. And that entire structure then becomes the beginning of what is a very difficult process to deal with because you've got different subpopulations of immortalized cells, all of them operating with different genotypes that have achieved all these various phenotype enabling characteristics, if you will. And the inflammation and the infiltrate around it creates this sort of permissive and reinforcing environment that and it reinforces many of these various features the, of the cells and allows this a process of intravasation and the uh, cells to escape into the vasculature, which is uh, enabling of the tissue invasion and metastasis. As cells transition, the epithelial cells transition to mesenchymal cells, which have stem-like characteristics. They are undifferentiated and they behave in ways that aren't um, structurally sound and therefore they're able to be more mobile and to relocate and colonize in distant parts of uh, cancers. And then the tumor microenvironment itself because you can take a cancerous mass from one animal and you can transplant it to another animal and if you put it in surrounding tissue that is normal the tumor will be shut down. So what we know in cancers is that the surrounding tissues are also aberrant and they're also permissive and they're actually cooperating with the cells in the tumor and creating a permissive environment where this sort of behavior is tolerated, where this wouldn't be happening in a normal animal. And so the various elements, the stem cells in the tumor microenvironment, the immune cells, the inflammatory cells, all of those uh, various elements in that tumor niche um, have certain characteristics that are unique and allow this process of immortalization to occur. If you think about it, and this is from a disruption standpoint, we've crossed many layers of defense in this process. The DNA repair at the beginning, the actual process that should shut a cell down that's aberrant or behaving poorly, that repair process has been overwhelmed tumor suppressors, which should stop tum cancer cells from replicating. They have been bypassed or they're non-functional in some manner. The pro various forms of progr programmed cell death aren't working properly and they're not allowing these cells to stop themselves from replicating. The process of senescence, the, the, these cells are not senescing as they should. That process is being bypassed. This immortalization process of making an infinite number of copies of themselves. The transition from the epithelial cells to mesenchymal cells in their stem-like states and the immune surveillance which should shut these tumors down, it's being bypassed. And the permissive environment that the tissues surrounding the tumor are experiencing, it's being defeated as well. That, or that permissive environment, sorry, that's being created by those surrounding tissues it's also in a state that's unusual and therefore that's another layer of defense. You won't see the list topic of layers in defense in the literature, but I'm just trying to get you to understand that there are a lot of hurdles that have been cleared through these various phenotypes that I've described that allow you to understand the very nuanced number of changes that have happened to these cells and the cells around them and the systems around them that enable this whole process to unfold the way that it does. In therapeutics, what we're learning is that we can take a specific chemical, a specific molecule, and we can reach inside these cells or to the surface of these cells or to the environment around these cells, 
and we can target specific mechanisms, molecular mechanisms or pathways, and we can stop various things from happening. And targeted therapies have created some fascinating and some very exciting and promising results, and more recently immunotherapy, because we're realizing that we can inspire and instigate different parts of the immune system, we can act on certain cellular and intracellular mechanisms, and each chemical has the ability through, in some cases, lock and key mechanisms, and in some case, pathway activation, We've, we can actually act on these various aspects of cellular biology with specific chemicals. The question we have to ask is, why wouldn't it be the same in mixtures? Why couldn't we envision chemicals that aren't necessarily carcinogens, that aren't carcinogenic on their own? that have the capacity, if they are lodged in certain tissues in the human body, to act on these various mechanisms in very profound ways, and in combination with one another, produce synergies to allow this to take place. Now, this is not an easy idea to get our heads around, or our minds around. It's a complex uh, biological system. But understand that the likelihood of one chemical doing all of those things, defeating all of those layers of defense, is pretty low. I mean, we do have carcinogens that we know a single chemical agent can cause cancer, but that's a pretty high bar because there's a lot of biology that has to be enabled by a single chemical for that to happen. So we started out with a very poor understanding of cancer biology 30 or 40 years ago when we started identifying chemicals that could cause cancer probably even before that, because Angel Raffo in Argentina, Argentina was doing work on benzopyrene and other kinds of constituents within tobacco tars in the 40s that was shown making convincing case for how certain constituents within tobacco could actually cause cancer. But since then, we've been on a hunt for carcinogens. We've been looking for single chemicals that could cause cancer. We've tried to characterize them, understand the mechanisms that they've acted on, and we've identified many of them, and, and that's been a good start. But now we're faced with this very troubling reality that we have hundreds of chemicals, if not thousands, in the environment that we're exposed to that are unavoidable, that we eat, they're in our food, we breathe, they're in our air, they're in our water. They're coming from a wide variety of sources. They are coming into our bodies, they're lodging in various tissues. They're not all going to the same locations. Some chemicals have better tif different tissue affinities for uh, uh, certain parts of the body. And what do we make of all those chemicals coalescing in various tissues within the body? And could we imagine a scenario where chemicals that weren't carcinogens were actually acting in ways that were enabling some of these phenotypes that I described and producing and synergies that we couldn't anticipate because we've never tested for those kinds of synergies before. This is the sort of history of uh, the, the underpinnings of the project that we undertook starting in 2012 to 2015 to look at that question. And we knew that mutagens historically had been our focus for carcinogens and that single agents were being were our focus for carcinogens we focused on single chemicals that could cause cancer, but the group that was brought together in the Halifax project was interested in big combinations of chemicals and how many of them might be conspiring or how few of them might be conspiring and what is it that they might be doing that we could potentially be having low-dose subcarcinogenic effects that were conspiring to produce carcinogenic synergies. Some EPA research that was happening around the beginning, uh, United States EPA research that was happening around the time we began the project was a process by, whereby they had hundreds of chemicals with, in many cases, in vitro data using assays that had been labeled based on mechanisms that were relevant for the various hallmarks. And the, the research they did was quite simple. They took chemicals and they said, they put them through hundreds of uh, high throughput uh, assays and they tried to decide whether or not a single chemical had a lot of activity on enabling mechanisms that were related to the 10 hallmarks or not. 
and they binned them based on a rough order of priority, chemicals that acted on many hallmarks or mechanisms related to many hallmarks, and chemicals that did not. And then they took two-year rodent study data that they had, and they said, what do we know about these chemicals? We've got two-year rodent studies, feeding studies, where we um, know that two years of exposure of a particular chemical causes cancer in rodents or not. And the, the conclusion that they came to after testing 292 chemicals and 672 assays was that those that were most active across the most mechanisms related to the hallmarks were more likely to be carcinogenic. Now, the reason that the EPA did this process is they were trying to prioritize their attempts to find carcinogens. In other words, they were trying to figure out out of the, all the chemicals they had to deal with, which ones were carcinogens. And so, let's take the ones that have the most activity across the most hallmarks and if we have a new chemical we've never seen before, let's test it against all these high throughput assays and maybe we can assume that there's a good chance it might be carcinogenic because of its activity across all these assays that are tied to the hallmarks. It's a relatively simple kind of an experiment, but they were able to show based on retrospective data that it held true, at least for the chemicals that they studied. What's interesting though is the, this question. There's 292 chemicals that they studied and they all go in your food. Most of these were from a data set of chemicals that are in foods. And the question that I raised with the lead investigator was, so you have all 300 chemicals going into the food, what do you do with that? Forget the fact that one chemical has more activity than the other. What if we take all 300 and we feed them to somebody? Well, the EPA doesn't have any answers to that because they're not there yet. That's a very difficult question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a troubling question, but their focus has been on finding individual chemicals that cause cancer, not mixtures. So that's why we took this approach. The project itself uh, started with the foundation of uh, Getting to Know Cancer, which is m the NGO that I work for. It's a nonprofit. Uh, I'm a volunteer. We have an advisory board of esteemed researchers, and we recruited 350 scientists for 31 countries, and we put them on 24 teams. Twelve of those teams were focused on this problem. 174 scientists were involved in the chemical mixtures task force. A number of them were from uh, Japan, and their goal was to use cutting-edge biology to inform toxicology and risk assessment, to basically produce a coherent argument in the peer-reviewed literature that tells us whether or not we should be concerned. Are there combinations of common chemicals that you're exposed to every day that uh, potentially are acting on mechanisms that matter? And do we have some potential concern that they could be acting at low doses, at in what are environmentally relevant doses, and that those activities at those doses could conspire to produce carcinogenic synergies? Um, we had toxicologists on most of the teams, uh, including uh, Dr. Sony from Japan on one of the teams. We had, uh, each team was asked to pick pathways and mechanisms that they felt were particularly important. We used the hallmarks of cancer as an organizing framework for the teams. We weren't particularly focused on the hallmarks phenotypes. We were more focused on finding a way to organize the researchers. So we put them in groups that were roughly organized along the uh, hallmarks. And we said, you tell us which pathways and mechanisms are most relevant and what kinds of disruptions you think are most important. And we want you to identify uh, chemicals of interest that could act on those pathways or mechanisms and let us know whether or not they're a concern at low doses and whether or not we're exposed to them in, in a way that's, that are unavoidable. And we specifically asked them to avoid any chemicals that were carcinogens. So if anything was a, a class one carcinogen, we asked them to avoid them. We were only interested in chemicals that weren't carcinogenic or weren't believed to be carcinogenic. We wanted to know if things that are out there that we think are safe or, or probably not, we wanted to know if we had any evidence to suggest that we should be concerned about the kinds of mixture effects that I described. I'm not going to go into the details of the results. Uh, Bill Goodson, who follows me, will uh, give, the, give you that detail. But I do want to show you that we looked at all the different 10 hallmark areas, and we did come up with various compounds. 
and chemicals in each of those areas that was relevant and active at various dose levels. And he can talk to you about that in some detail. I want to con contrast this with the current guidance from the World Health Organization's um, mode of action framework because when they look at cumulative effects, they're only focusing on chemicals that produce a common adverse outcome. So we need a series, we, if we were going to consider additive effects of chemicals that you might be exposed to, we're only interested in additive effects if those chemicals cause cancer of the same type. We're only interested if they act by the same sequence of events, and we're only interested if they act on the same common tissue. But in practice, there's not a lot of data to support this approach to begin with. There simply isn't enough descriptive data on chemicals that we're exposed to for that sort of cumulative assessment to even be done. And the biology of the disease that I've just described to you suggests that these approaches underestimate the kinds of synergies that I'm talking about because we could have cancer, um, we could have uh, dissimilar sequences and processes that are all contributing. We could have actions on the immune system, actions on DNA repair, actions related to inflammation. We could have actions related to different kinds of sequences and processes and yet they could still be contributing to the disease. And the uh, mode of action uh, adverse event outcome, path, uh, mode of action and adverse event outcomes don't anticipate that kind of complexity. We need to be able to, it doesn't anticipate chemicals acting on different targets or tissues and it doesn't uh, anticipate synergies of non-carcinogens, chemicals that don't cause cancer. So if a chemical doesn't cause an adverse outcome to begin with, we aren't looking for cumulative effects that it might cause and we aren't looking for synergies that it might produce. The hypothesis that we emerged from in the paper that we wrote, and it really was a large hypothesis paper. We had 12 teams work for two, more than two years on a project that really emerged with a hypothesis, and that was that the low-dose exposures to mixtures of chemicals in the environment may be acting in concert with one another to cause cancers. It might seem like a large exercise to just come up with a hypothesis, but it was really trying to validate whether or not the idea was even something we should be concerned about. And I'll let Bill fill you in on the details of how we reached that conclusion. We published an entire special issue in carcinogenesis with uh, 12 papers, one for each of the teams, and a synthesis paper, which is uh, Bill Goodson's uh, lead author effort, and that's uh, something that I can provide references for if anybody wants. Subsequent to that, we met in, um, at NIEHS, which is uh, sort of like NICE, only in the United States, and we had their scientists come and talk about, uh, review the work that we had done, and we published another publication after that in Environmental Health Perspectives, and the key finding there is that the theoretical merits of the hypothesis are well-founded with clear biological relevance. Again, just a confirmation that their concerns and the hypothesis that we formed seem reasonable. If you, we're not the only ones that are moving forward on this issue, and IARC uh, and, I'm, and um, is Dr. Smith and, uh, is going to talk later about these uh, characteristics that they've identified that are characteristic of human carcinogens. Now understand these are chemicals that are known to be uh, carcinogens on their own. Uh, these are various characteristics that are commonly exhibited, uh, one or more of them, in various cancers. And, uh, Dr. Smith will uh, talk more about that later. But the point is, many of these are the kinds of mechanisms that we're talking about within the Hallmarks framework. They're framed differently, but these are various types of disruption that are being caused by chemicals and agents. The Hallmarks, the cancer themselves, are properties of cancer cells. They're not the actions of agents. What we're interested in is the actions of the agents. We use the framework to create an organizing way of putting our task force together but ultimately our concern is what kinds of disruptions do chemicals do and could chemicals that aren't carcinogens that have these same kinds of effects at low doses conspire to produce the ty types of synergies that I'm talking about. So you can think about these as enabling phenotypes. We're not inherently or not specifically focused on these phenotypes. We're interested in the under underlying mechanistic disruptions that chemicals cause to produce the types of genotypes that underlie these phenotypes that produce 
these various sequences and allow this whole process to unfold. The thing that I want you to think about as you go through the rest of today and tomorrow is I want you to think, don't think about carcinogens. I mean, we'll talk about carcinogens, sure. But I, we have 30 years or 40 years of vocabulary focus on carcinogens and a hunt for single chemicals that are carcinogens. We, our emphasis has been, let's find those chemicals that cause cancer and get rid of them. That's been the goal. It might not be that simple. We may have hundreds of chemicals that are contributing to synergies that are producing cancers, and those chemicals may not be carcinogens. They, no, te no amount of testing may show them to be carcinogens. Now, the question you'll ask me is, so what do we do with that information? We can't ban all chemicals. Uh, I'll, I'm going to speak to that later. That's not the idea, but we need to understand what's happening, and we don't have the science to support this. At this point in time, we're describing a problem, and I think we've done a good job at describing the problem, but there are still questions that need to be answered. Our interest is in the disruptive agents and what they are and what it takes to produce cancers. We don't have those answers yet, but we believe that it's a realistic, that it's plausible that this is happening. The problem that many of the researchers in the task force came to was that carcinogenesis is a bit of a black box. We know what cancer looks like, and we know what disruptive actions look like, but the process and the sequences that unfold is not well described. And if you go looking in the literature for good articles that describe carcinogenesis, what it takes, what kinds of influences could produce cancers, we've, we've lost the path. The cigarette industry was probably the furthest along in this. Raffo's work, which was producing experimental cancers with tobacco tars in the 30s and 40s, was followed by a massive effort by the tobacco industry. And if you dig into the tobacco industry archives, you'll find hundreds, thousands of articles where they're doing research on how various constituents within the chemistry of the tobacco were actually contributing to the kinds of mechanisms that could produce cancers. Of course, they were very careful not to bring any of that research to public, but much of their work is now uh, available, has been brought through court actions, and it's available through tobaccodocuments.org. But my point is, is that that whole process, they had enormous immaculate and pristine mouse labs with thousands of mice in some of the best facilities in the world, doing skin painting studies, inhalation studies. They were studying how various chemical combinations could produce cancers. And as they moved towards new smoking material, they were trying to get away from tobacco, leaf tobacco. They were trying to produce synthetic mixtures and combinations that would reduce the carcinogenicity of their product without, without telling the public. And if you look in the literature, you'll find that they were doing experiments where they would change the makeup of the chemical cocktail that your humans were being exposed to, and they were studying it in mice to try and find better results where there were fewer, fewer cases of cancer. Um, one of their most successful um, efforts in this regard was actually too good. It, it actually had almost no cancer, but uh, used some very exotic materials. And because they were going to expose the fact that they were making an effort, they abandoned that project completely. The chemical industry is very underhanded in the way they approached it. But my point is they were on the right path. What they were trying to do is to figure out how do various chemicals act, what kinds of processes are enabled, and how do we produce cancers. We don't have that research. And if you'll recall the Dahl and Pito article that put us on lifestyle factors, you know, get people to stop smoking, get people to stop drinking, get people to improve their diet, get people to be less sexually promiscuous, get people to do, stay out of the sun. That whole effort, 30 years of effort on getting influencing people's behavior for lifestyle factors were lost decades where groups like NICE and NIEHS and Health Canada and other organizations were underfunded and they lost their capacity to learn about how to solve and study cancer because they didn't have the funding to do it. Because it was believed that chemicals were such a small part of the problem that it didn't matter. This is complicated by the fact that when we study single carcinogens, we know that the single chemical that is the bad actor always ends up in the same place. That chemical is by itself enabling, enable to produce cancer on its own, remarkably. 
Um, but in mixtures, we can think of ingesting various chemicals through food and air and water, and those chemicals may end up in different places. Now, the nice thing is we have radio tracer labeling studies of various chemicals that have been tested, and we do know in some cases with certain kinds of chemicals that accumulate in the thymus or in the pancreas or in different parts of the body. And we could, from, we could choose chemicals that all accumulate in the same tissues, and we could study the synergies, synergies that are produced by those chemicals based on what we know about where those chemicals go. Um, this is not a perfect science, but it's a, it's a complicating factor when we study mixtures because uh, we uh, have to deal with that. How much time does that give me? Five minutes. I want to talk briefly about futures research because I firmly believe that basics mixture research is still needed. We need step-by-step -step, uh, uh, understanding of how pro-carcinogenic uh, pro synergies, both in vitro and in, vitro, uh, in vivo, are produced. And we need to look at dose response and how that changes. Subcarcinogenic non-carcinogens at subcarcinogenic doses should be able to be combined to produce carcinogenic synergies in ways that would uh, betray our current system of screening chemicals. Because we use dose response to find thresholds that are safe. But what if we're talking about actors that are acting at lower dose levels and combining to produce the kinds of disruptive synergies that I talked about? We need to engineer mixtures. We need to pick you. The problem with our very siloed approach to science is that we get labs that focus on certain classes of chemicals, and they are interested in groups of chemicals and how they might act together. Or we get labs that are focused on mechanisms, and they're interested in the immune system, and so they focus on how chemicals in, interact with the immune system. But what we really need is somebody that can take on a wide range of chemicals that are hand-picked for their disruptive uh, capacity and to do predictable synergies based on ways in which we think they should act together to reach those phenotypes that I'm talking about. And then we need to look at dose response and whether or not we can take synergistic sets of chemicals and take them to much lower dose levels and still get them to produce those synergies. That's something that hasn't been done. That's a career's worth of work for many scientists, but it's important work that's missing. And we can't study tissues of people who have cancer and study chemistry that's in there, chemicals they've accumulated over the years. We can't do uh, agricultural studies where we look at exposures people have had and cancers they got and make direct correlations about these chemicals cause these diseases. We can through raw epidemiology, but it won't be informed by the kind of mechanistic understanding that we now have the ability to produce. We need those mechanistic studies, very basic research, that can show how those mixtures can work. I'll give you a quick example. I know I'm running out of time, but we've known for a long time that mutagens can produce cancers, and we know that something that disrupts DNA repair, and I'll use EDTA, EDTA for example, because EDTA is in everything. It's in hair, it's in sunscreen, it's in everything. If you look at the literature on EDTA, it, it's a disruptor of DNA repair. And I would ask you, why would we put a disruptor of DNA repair in our sunscreen? Uh, because if we have ionizing radiation causing damage to DNA, why would we be disrupting that DNA repair process? If, but we know from the literature, even on early literature on, on EDTA, that it's going to exacerbate the effects of the mutagen. And the, and the question I would ask you is, that's an easy synergy to envision. And I can guarantee you, you could probably give very high doses of EDTA. You could give all kinds of EDTA to an animal and it may never get cancer. But if it was disrupting its DNA repair mechanisms, then additional chemicals are going to produce synergies that might be enabled by the fact that the DNA repair is not working properly. There's nothing, don't quote me on EDTA, I mean, you can quote me, but <laughs> there's no compelling literature that says EDTA can't be in foods, but this is work that hasn't been done. It's intuitively strange that we have a chemical that disrupts DNA repair in so much of what we eat, use for hygienic products, etc. Soaps, you name it, it's everywhere. And yet, we don't, it, it, if we were to study EDTA and, and ask whether it's relevant to cancer, we would only be checking to see if that chemical alone fed to an animal would produce cancers. That's not how the sort of synergies that I'm talking about work. We're talking about creating enablements and stages along the way that contribute and conspire to produce cancer as a whole. Remember those layers of defense, all kinds of different ways in which we can
we, all kinds of different aspects of, of the disease that need to be enabled. And we have disruptive chemical effects that can happen along any one of those aspects. The question I'm asking is, what does it take to produce cancers? What's the minimum number that we can do? The key question is, what's the absolute minimum set that we could come up with? That would be really, really interesting to know. If we took IARC's mechanisms of carcinogenesis or any one of these various phenotypic enablements that I'm talking about, and we could find three things that, when combined, was enough to start the process, which is we know is eventually self-running. Knowing what those three things are would be very powerful information and help inform all of our decision-making going forward. One last thing that I'll say, we have huge amount of specialization and this is not something to be taken on by one person. This is something that needs some scope, it needs some vision, and it's going to require collaboration. And this is a picture of the group that was involved in the Halifax project, and I think Dr. Sony is in the front on the right there. But uh, I think the idea is we know that we can uh, collaborate on these problems. People, are, people, then they understand the problem, are willing to bring their skills to bear but we need to find ways to collaborate to solve this very complex problem. Thank you very much. I think it's a, a good question, very good question, and you know, many of the people that were involved in the project study carcinogens, so people weren't very happy when I said we don't want to look at carcinogens because many of them have done their own research, extensive research on carcinogens proper. What we didn't want to do was to confuse the issue because there has been, always been a focus on carcinogens. We have decades of that work and we understand that's important work that needs to be done. And the question you're raising about whether or not an accumulation over time of low doses of carcinogens could, could matter, absolutely. And in fact, there's no reason that contributions of those agents at low doses couldn't be also combined or enabled or supported by non-carcinogens that are also having mechanistic activity that's disruptive in nature. So yes, I agree. Thank you. So one of the problems with characterizing the mixture that we're exposed to, so we have human exposome, we have all kinds of pro human biomonitoring, we have all kinds of initiatives happening to characterize the things that people are exposed to. But the question I would ask is once we have that information, how will we know whether or not it matters or not? And the reason that I'm asked, posing that question is because we don't have 
a basic understanding of what kinds of combinations of mixtures will produce cancers. And that's missing. If we had that information, then if we went out and checked and see what are people exposed to, we could say, oh, incredible, you know, we've got uh, maybe DNA repair, if I could give an example, is really important. And we've got all kinds of chemicals, we now, we, we screen them all, and we discover that many of them are disruptive of DNA repair. And we discover that that, that alone, with one or two other things, can make a huge difference. Maybe we draw on an, a line and say, um, well, DNA repair is sacred, and we don't want to be adding chemicals into foods as additives or as pesticides or insecticides or other things that people are exposed to that are disruptive in that way. Uh, that might be a new, a new decision that we make. But right now, we don't have any basic understanding of which of those various enabling disruptive processes matter most. We don't know which combinations are the most potent and are able to produce cancers at the lowest dose levels. And so if we do all the biomonitoring and epidemiological work that we want, we're still going to be left with trying to match mature cancers to the exposures. We will never be able to look at what were the underlying steps that occurred to get us there. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not... So you mentioned engineered mixtures. So, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, I'm saying, if I wanted to design a cancer-causing mixture, what would that look like? I, I'm, I, if, if, imagine we start a lab and our goal is to produce mixtures that cause cancer. Not with carcinogens, with things that aren't carcinogens. Let's pick agents that have disruptive capabilities and let's figure out what combinations, what are the minimal combinations we could produce that have the most potency and could operate at the lowest doses and conspire to produce cancers or instigate or start the process of carcinogenesis, which we know is self-reinforcing at some stage. How far along do we have to get it? What are the kinds of... And so I'm calling that engineered mixtures because to me that's a design issue. Like how do we build mixtures that... Could, if we had a good understanding of what it takes to produce cancers, then we would have a better way of understanding wh what happens in the real world when we're talking about what kinds of exposures are people f facing. We don't have, it's like that process of carcinogenesis remains a bit of a black box. We know some of the things that carcinogens do, that's good information. IARC has produced a litany of things that we know are occurring with chemicals that can cause cancer on their own. We know from the phenotypes, which I will call enabling aspects of the disease, we know what the endpoint looks like, so mechanisms that lead to those endpoints should be clues as to an, uh, pathways or enabling steps that would be required to get us there. But, you know, there might be multiple ways to disrupt in such a way that you can produce cancer, but we don't know what those multiple ways are. But, so I'm saying we need to be able to engineer mixtures that are dangerous, that are carcinogenic, and if we really understood how to do that well, then when somebody said we've got these kinds of exposures and we can characterize these chemicals in this way, and this is what the population is being exposed to, we'd know whether or not those exposures were dangerous because we'd know what the early stages of the disease look like, which we don't know now. Other questions? Uh, I agree with the importance of the uh, approach on uh, 
exploited to uh, chemical mixtures on carcinogenicity. But, but uh, probably that uh, you mentioned about the uh, 11 core marks about the uh, chemical types of cancer. But that uh, I would not deny that are uh, core marks. But there are the hallmarks of other biological responses, not only specific to uh, carcinogenesis. And the other thing is, uh, in the uh, approach that you mentioned, it may lack the uh, factor of time. In other words, you know, uh, as you may know, uh, may probably all of the audience know that uh, this is a adenocarcinoma was in the cancer in the lung. It take uh, let's say about one centimeter in size. Uh, it takes about 20 years to get a single cell to be a uh, uh, customer in the, in the lung, but probably possibly by second second hand smoking. But anyway, so in the uh, in your approach or in your groups in your group approach, how can so think about the uh, so this latency issue is something that was discussed quite a bit, and we're not suggesting that, um, well, I guess there's not a good understanding of the latency period. If you look for literature on latency, it's not clear. You know, there, there's been work obviously done on ge how frequent do genetic mutations occur, and to, could that uh, contribute, but we, there's belief that latency could happen for other reasons. And again, part of the reason we don't understand that is because we don't understand how the process unfolds. My point is we should be able to produce fast cancers. We should be able to engineer cells to produce cancers quickly. Uh, we should be able to skip the latency period. And in the process of uncovering how conspiring disruptive effects produce cancers, we should be able to figure out something about latency. We don't have that answer yet, but we should be able to learn it by dis being selectively disruptive and trying to engineer fast cancers. Uh, we should be able to speed the process along by, by making things happen, by introducing things and changing things and producing cancers in a very rapid way. And some of that learning is going to inform what we know about how process unfolds. Very good point. One of the things that not many people realize is that prior to the development of the NCI cancer bioassay program and the NTP, people mainly did time to tumor studies. So they did, they expected the animals to all get cancer after two years. And they just basically measured the, t the timing, how quickly could you get cancer. This was stopped by the NCI and then by NTP, who waited, wanted to do a two-year lifetime bioassay, which is actually quite difficult in mice because they only live for 18 months or so, um, and then look at the tumors at the end of life rather than the, the development. So there are many studies back in the 70s where they did a time to tumor type of analysis and got cancers very quickly in experimental animals. And maybe we need to go back to that. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much. Thank you.